Well, good morning. It's good to be with each and every one of you this morning. I want to wish a happy Father's Day to the fathers in our midst of this congregation and those who might be visiting, for those who are father figures to those in their lives, and for those of us certainly who have fathers and who uh, have those father figures in our lives that we look up to and cherish and have cherished throughout our lives. It's a day to remember and recognize that special role in our lives, whether we're fulfilling it or somebody else's towards us. And I was thinking about what to preach on for Father's Day, and I thought that we could spend some time together talking about Jesus' father, but more so his supposed father, and that's Joseph. I want to talk to you about Joseph. Now, when I told Scott I was going to preach on Joseph, he went to Genesis. Not, not that Joseph. We're, we're talking about um, Joseph in Matthew chapter 1. If you want to open your Bibles there to Matthew chapter 1, we're going to be talking about Joseph, the, the husband of Mary, And we're going to learn here about Joseph, and just to spoil it for you before we read through, as I was studying this and looking at the life of Joseph, which is, by the way, pretty much summed up uh, as, for the, as far as the Bible records it, in Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2, Joseph never says one single thing in the recorded scripture. As far as the Bible's concerned and what it's recorded, Joseph does not speak. Rather, we see in the accounts there of the first two chapters of these two Gospels that instead we have the Holy Spirit recording his actions, what he does in response to the situations and in response to God communicating with him. And so as we consider Joseph this morning, I want us to look at him as an example, his faith in action, and how it can be an example for our faith in action. That his faith is proven by his deeds, and so our faith is proven by the way that we behave and how we conduct ourselves. Well, let's look here in Matthew chapter 1 and look at Joseph, this man of action. Pick up with me beginning in chapter 1 and verse 18. The Bible reads, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way, When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. I find it fascinating there that it's Joseph who called his name Jesus. And so if he does speak, that's the little illusion, but we don't actually get his quote there. If you keep reading on into chapter 2, the great story that we're all so familiar with, that the birth happens there in Bethlehem, the angels appear to the shepherds, the shepherds come and praise God and, and see this child, the wise men come to see him, and they have some interaction with the king, Herod. And so Herod catches wind of all this, and he decides to put a plan into action. And so Joseph comes back into the story in chapter 2 and verse 13, if you'll read with me there. Now when they had departed, that is the wise men, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. You get the record here in the next few verses of Herod's atrocious act of killing all these young children. And then you pick up in verse 19. But when Herod died... An angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, 
He was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. We see here Joseph, again, not saying anything as far as the Bible records it for us, but constantly in motion, doing things in response to the situations around him and in response to God's word. Through the angels, through dreams, through these messages, Joseph is receiving communication from God and acting on them. You and I have the same opportunity as Joseph does. Though we aren't receiving messages in dreams like Joseph did, we have the fully revealed sufficient word of God telling us his will, of his love, of his plans and promises. And it's for those who are his children who would act in obedience. I find it fascinating if you turn over to Luke chapter 8 that you get the story of the rest of Jesus' earthly family here in Luke 8 with his mothers and his brothers as Jesus is teaching. And there's a little snippet where his father actually, at least as I'm studying and reading this, comes into play. In Luke chapter 8, verses 19 through 21, it says, Then Jesus' mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, Your mothers and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered them, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Jesus says it's not about this literal family line, but my family are those who hear God, listen to God, my father, and act in accordance with his will. And so while Joseph was not the biological father of Jesus, he was family with Jesus because he heard the word of God and he did it. What I appreciate most, I think, about Joseph is what we read of in chapter one in Matthew. Joseph had his human reasoning, certainly dealing with a challenging situation of figuring out what to do when he finds out Mary is pregnant before they have been officially wedded. And he resolves, it says in the scripture, to divorce her quietly. He doesn't want to shame her, and the Bible says he's a just man because he's come to this conclusion. He's a just man, and so he's trying to do what's right by the information that he knows at the time. And then he hears the word of God. This child is from the Holy Spirit. If you're Joseph, do you change your mind? Are you willing to change your mind and believe what God has told you is in fact true? That's the choice we face when we are posed with this proposition of hearing the word and then doing it. And it's important to take time to appreciate both of those. Because sometimes I think we just assume, yeah, that's in the Bible. Or yes, that's what this verse says. Or yes, that's the context. I know what God is like. Instead of taking the time every single day to sit down and hear from your father from his own word. Do we take that time to slow down and actually listen rather than just assuming, well, I've heard this so many times before? And then you've got the other side of the coin. Do we act in accordance with God's voice? It's one thing to sit and take in, but do we act on it? These last few months, we've been talking a lot about peace and what it looks like to keep ourselves in the love of God and that this peace guards us and keeps us in God's love. It's this peace that surpasses understanding. But here's where I want to make this application with this lesson. Peace isn't passive. Let me say that again. Peace is not passive. Peace isn't just something where I let things happen to me. Rather, Peace comes from conducting myself, acting in such a way that I know that I stand right before God. And so that I'm not passive in my peace, but that I am active, living it. And it's that peace that surpasses all understanding that even if there's hostility on the outside towards my action and behavior, it's that peace that guards my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus, as Philippians 4 will teach. 
But as we make application of this, we have to realize that there's a point where we have to make that shift to go from the hearing to the doing, where the words, whether we're reading them on the page or proclaiming them ourselves, we have to move from words to actually living it, to take our words into action. You think that Joseph was mute? You think he just couldn't talk and that's why the Bible doesn't actually say he said anything? No, he certainly said things. But that's not the point. We have, we have a phrase that actions will speak louder than words. And we see that here in the life of Joseph. It's easy to talk faith. The question is, are we walking the faith? I want to recognize and appreciate our brother Ben Hastings. He's been leading us during these times in a study through Paul's letters to Timothy and Titus. And this past week, he just started in the letter of Titus. And that study is going to continue this week and into next week. And the theme that he's laid out for us in those videos as we study through that book is that our beliefs are inherently tied to our behaviors. You cannot separate them. What you are up in here is going to impact the way that you speak and what your hands are doing and where your feet are going, the way that you treat others. And so we cannot divorce these two ideas of what I believe and the behaviors that come from my heart. We have to realize that this goes from putting a a place of theory, the idea of love, the idea of justice, the idea of peace, which are all very nice, And actually doing something in our lives that promotes those things, that strives for those things, that displays the love of Jesus in our lives. Do you love God? It's the easiest thing in the world to say, yeah, of course I love God. What do your actions show? Jesus will make this point over in uh, Matthew chapter 21 if you want to turn there with me. Matthew 21 is where Jesus will give a parable explaining the key difference between words and action. He's talking to the Pharisees here and gives them this parable of two sons beginning in Matthew 21 and verse 28. Jesus says, what do you think? A man had two sons and he went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. That's so powerful. The idea that we have the opportunity to change our minds just as Joseph did. When he changed his mind, I have to divorce her, I'm going to do it quietly. Now it's I'm going to follow God's word. I know what God wants me to do. He changed his mind. But these Pharisees that Jesus is talking to, they're not willing to change their mind. They're big about talking up the things of God, but are they willing to live it? Jesus, time and again, will call them hypocrites. You say one thing and you do another. That is not what your heavenly Father wants. God does not want your lip service, He wants your heart, He wants you. He, yes, he wants your words and he wants your actions. He wants your hands and feet. He wants your whole life dedicated to him so that we might say, just as the one who proved to be a true child to this father in the parable, I am a child of God. His holy commands are alive and on display in my life. Does that mean I'm perfect? No, I told him I'm not gonna go before. Jesus invited me and told me and I said no. I've sinned against God. But I took up this great offer of grace and peace and now you and I have the opportunity to be his children. But that requires us acting to serve him, to do the things that show honor and glory to his name. 
But again, directly connected to this idea of if we're going to love God comes with the idea of how we, in our actions, love other people. All other people. In 1 John chapter 3, John will make this point pretty clear. And it's a theme that you see throughout this letter that God's love is directly connected to the love that we show or that we don't show to other people, whether that love is alive in our own hearts and what that says about our relationship with God. 1 John chapter 3, 16 through 18, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, How does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Let's not just love by what we say. It's easy to say and speak things of love. Let's act in love, in deed and in truth. I thought about this when I was reflecting and meditating on this idea. We are people of our word, because we are people of his word. When I say that I'm a child of God, when I proclaim the things that are in God's word, I do those things. We are people of our word, sincere, authentic, genuine, because we have his word in our heart, because it's transforming us and making us into his image and showing us the ways of God. You know, Paul was accused of having this weak presence over in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 10 through 11. There were some that were telling the church in Corinth, look, he can talk a big game, but he's got a weak physical, you know, he's here and he looks feeble. He's timid seeming. And Paul says in verse 11, let them understand what we say when we're absent from you, we do when we are present. This is not about lip service. Everything that Paul does, from the discipline that he shows to the Corinthian church and other churches, to the service, to in context of this, that letter, not taking money from them, but that he would preach the gospel free of charge, all of those things are done because he loves their souls and he wants them to be saved. He wants them to be children of God as he is. And so he shows that love in action. And I think it bears mentioning here, just in case anybody's gotten there ahead of me, speaking is part of acting. There are times when we need to speak up and say the things that are necessary. But there's a complete pendulum swing that sometimes happens where we go too far and think that I've shared this thing on Facebook, so yep, I've accomplished my task. I've spread the gospel. I commented on a post I don't agree with. Yep, I've shared the gospel. What do we see in front of us but the opportunity to act on things? We can love others and love God through the ways that we act, but sometimes when we're so inundated with information, sometimes it's just the sharing and the commenting. When are we going to get out and do these things and live these things? James chapter 2 will carry this thought of 1 John to its natural conclusion as far as what it says about our faith in our actions. In James chapter 2, 14 through 26, has the whole conversation here about the relationship between our faith and the idea that it's going to express itself in the ways that we act. For this morning, I want to focus focus in on verses 14 through 17. James chapter 2, 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It's a 
bold statement that we have recorded for us in scripture. That if my faith isn't being actually lived out, if it's just all up in here and it doesn't look any different in the way that I live my life, he says that our faith is dead. And notice in context that it's directly connected to how I interact with and see and treat other people. My faith in God is proven alive or dead based on how I act towards brethren in the church, towards strangers that I come into contact with, to people that I never come into contact with. But the way that I talk to people, talk about people, whether I know them or not. For us, putting our words into action, and I'll use James's example here, is no longer just saying, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and now it becomes being a peacemaker. Amen. Being one who acts to create, to share, to promote peace, and to make a difference where we have those opportunities. Does that sound hard to you? It does to me. Sometimes we're faced in situations where those can be challenging situations. But I think back to Joseph and how he had to put his trust in God into action. When you and I are living out our faith, we will have to put our trust into action. You know, if you go back in, into Matthew 1 and 2 and consider that those passages we read, Joseph had a lot of hard decisions to make. And there were a lot of troubling things that were going on as he was trying to carry out God's commands. Just, just consider a few of them here. We mentioned it a little bit earlier, but to be betrothed to somebody, young, happily soon-to-be-married couple, and you find out that your wife is pregnant, I, how do you even start processing that? when you know the kind of woman she is, when, when you're trying to just make sense of that situation. This is before he has the dream. He's trying to do what's right. He's trying to, he's trying to be just like he's, the Bible describes him. He's, he's trying to not shame her, but he's still trying to do... It's exhausting. It's heartbreaking. It's a trial. And then go on. You realize that a king wants this child dead. A king wants your child, this, this one that you are in charge of, even if he's not your biological son, this child in your care. This king wants dead. And so you run off into Egypt, which historically is not that great of a place for Jews. Then you come back after the king is dead and you're thinking, well, Judea, that makes sense for the Messiah to come up in this place. But guess what? Archelaus is ruling there. I won't go into the details, but this was just one of four different sons that Herod the king left in their own little sections of his region that he was reigning. Archelaus was just as bad as his father, if not worse. Cruel, oppressive, murderous. And so being warned in a dream, Joseph goes to Galilee instead. Everything's solved, right? Have you heard of Nazareth? It's got a reputation. That's what some of the soon-to-be disciples say when they say this Jesus of Nazareth. Well, what good could come out of Nazareth? And so you put yourself in Joseph's shoes in all these places, and you have to imagine he's thinking, God can't possibly mean for me to do this. Can he? Can he? For us, it's recorded, it's written down. But that still doesn't mean that it doesn't require trust. It does require trusting his word. Joseph had so much that could have overwhelmed him in the moment. And certainly we can get caught in that same trap. It is so, so easy to fixate on or become overwhelmed by the trials and the darkness of the world around us. But putting my trust in God into action means that I focus on his goodness instead. That that is what drives me in my action and my motivation. Romans 4, I think, has a lot to say 
about faith in God in the midst of overwhelming or seemingly overwhelming odds. In context here, it's talking about Abraham, but I, I think about Joseph and his circumstance, and by extension, us, as we are facing trials and how we put our trust into action even in those situations. I'll pick up in Romans 4 and verse 18. Again, context here, it's talking about Abraham and his type of faith. It says in 18, in hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he has been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. You see this example of mountain-moving faith that Joseph had, that Abraham has, that you and I can have. It doesn't mean that things look picture perfect. It means despite those circumstances, I'm willing to step out in faith trusting that God is faithful to his promises, that when he calls me to do hard things, like he asked Joseph to do hard things, that I can trust him and do those things. Well, let's not be vague about it. Is it hard to love your enemies? Depends on who you think of when you think of the word enemy, I suppose. God calls us to love our enemies. God calls us to forgive and have a forgiving spirit. Is that hard sometimes? Yeah, yeah, it can be. God calls us to repent when we are wrong, to admit that we're wrong, to change our mind. God calls us to share his word with other people. Does that create awkward situations? It certainly can. God calls us to remove the influences of the world from our lives. Jesus will describe it as plucking out an eye or cutting off a hand if those things would keep you from entering into the kingdom of heaven. He says, it's worth it. The question is, is it scary to cut off your hand or pluck out your eye, spiritually speaking? I think I know people who would rather cut off their hand rather than give up the thing that's keeping them out of their heavenly Father's loving arms because they're not listening and trusting him. If you would just get rid of these things. So yes, God calls you, his children, all people, to do hard things. But I want to let you in on something. It's worth it every time. Every time. The great promise that we see fulfilled in the case of Romans 4. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised Jesus from the dead, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification, that we are right in his sight. That's what motivates us. That's what gives us the confidence and trust that even when we're facing these obstacles, we can act like Joseph did and act in trust. Our faith can conquer whatever fears might be present in our lives. When God directs us to do hard things, we can trust him and we can live for him. I'll end with this question for you that comes from James 2 as we read. If you consider your faith, is it alive or is it dead? Is your faith in action today? Is it a faith that expresses itself through the way that you behave and the way, yes, that you speak? Where do you need to put your faith into action this coming week? It's important to take the time to think and to study and to discuss, but don't stop there. Let's 
get out and do it. Live the gospel, share his love and his truth in the words that you say and in the things that you do. For the fathers in the audience, as you meditate today on 